นะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระ
holding the breath for long periods, fasting, uh, going naked, not having any clothing, living in a very simple way and when, maybe even pushing oneself physically, so going without sleep, going without comforts, not bathing, and some extreme ones like standing on one leg for long periods, imitating animals like dogs and cows, walking on hot coals, all kinds of what we call ascetic practices which push body and mind to extremes but don't actually result in liberation from the causes of suffering. Maybe even make you unhappy in the process. Certainly uh, the Buddha explored that to his completion. He explored those practices, tried them out following the teachers of his day and he was very disciplined, very determined being a Buddha or Buddha to be when he was still Bodhisattva. So he pushed himself to almost the point where he killed himself. But he realized ultimately this is not the way out of suffering. So he gave up. So what he realized finally that led him to his enlightenment experience, to experience Nibbana, was the middle way, which he then proceeded to teach other people over the rest of his life and summarized as the Noble Eightfold Path. It's the middle way of practice. It's neither the way of sensual indulgence nor extreme asceticism, self-deprivation. But it's the way that is effective for cultivating the right qualities that awaken this human mind to truth. So we summarize the Eightfold Noble Path as uh, Sila Samadhi Panya, morality, meditation, wisdom, insight. So ultimately, it's, is insight into the nature of phenomena is what will realize, bring one to realize the end of suffering. So this is what breaks through delusion, ignorance, which undermines, underlies our, our experience of suffering, produces more suffering. Why do we suffer? Because we're not fully aware of what suffering is, what it causes. We don't realize what we're doing fully. So we create suffering for ourselves. And that's another reflection that the Buddha gave. If we're suffering or stressed in life, we do it to ourselves. <laughs> Even though other people sometimes seem to be the cause of our suffering, or other animals, beings. Like today, it's very hot, so there's lots of flies. So you may say, oh, I'm suffering because of the flies. But really, if you look more closely, you're, you're suffering because of your reaction to the flies. And that's something personal. If you meet flies with ignorance, unawareness, lack of mindfulness, lack of restraint, well, you might get hot and bothered and annoyed, upset, stressed. But the real cause is not the flies, it's your own mind. And that applies to everything, doesn't it? Suffering is you know, not getting what we want and getting what we don't want. Ultimately, we're the cause of that. It lies within our own mind. Other people are on the periphery and they may, you know, even if somebody is hurting you or bullying you, of course that is a part of the cause of your suffering, it's a condition for your suffering, but the actual experience of suffering is personal, it's internal. Physical, mental pain, discomfort, stress, worry, fear, anxiety, all of the different things 
you experience them. And the Buddha centered his teachings on this process of cause and effect. So he pointed out we're constantly receiving the results of our past actions. So if you are getting bullied by other people or you're getting bothered by flies, yeah, it's because of your past craving and attachment. And this is coming back to you maybe at this time in the experience of flies or somebody else annoying you in some way but it's actually your own karma that you've created causes for in the past and some of our karma is simply the karma of being born Lumpo Cha would say that quite often when people say why do I have to suffer he said because you were born very simple. If those people who don't get born don't suffer. <laughs> who doesn't get born? Well, the Arahants, the Buddhas, people who've reached Nibbana, they don't suffer because they don't get born again. So they don't suffer. But we suffer because we were born. We actually wanted to be born. <laughs> so we're volunteering for more suffering when we get born. We just chanted in the uh, Buddha's words on loving kindness, the Karaniya Metta Sutta. You know, those uh, spreading thoughts of kindness to those who are born and to be born. Sampawesi means to, to, to be born, beings, consciousness, queuing up for birth. You, in the Buddha's description, you know, what is birth? It's, uh, there's a consciousness waiting for an egg to be fertilized by a sperm and then it joins. If everything goes well, the conditions are right, that consciousness gets a chance at birth. That's a sample way see it. It's to be born, a being who's waiting to be born, getting their chance because they want to be born. When we die, what is the last thought you have? If you're unenlightened, well, you, you, you want more birth, don't you? Even if you're already a very wise, refined kind of person, you want to be born again so you can finish off the job and reach enlightenment next life, if you haven't done it this life. So you want birth. Probably more, more naturally would be you'd want birth because you want more to experience more sights, sound, taste, smell, touch. You're not fed up with the world yet. <laughs> you know, sometimes we get fed up with the world, but that's usually just aversion when we don't get what we want. And then we say, I hate you, or I hate the world, or I'm fed up with life. But when we are close to our death, we actually have this wish to be born again, because we don't want to die. It's the same thing, isn't it? holding on to life or wishing for life is a wish that goes with you to, to your grave, as it were. And it brings you back, depending on your karma, what kind of birth you attain next time around. So we volunteer for birth. So that means you volunteered to be pestered by flies on hot days. <laughs> You can't blame that on anyone. You can't pin that down on anyone. You can't blame the cows for doing the poo that becomes the place where the flies get born. It's just life. The world is full of all kinds of experiences that we don't really want. And we like the good stuff, the pleasant stuff, but we don't want the unpleasant stuff. So we're not always being honest with ourselves because we're not fully aware of truth so we miss out on what's going on half the time and say, oh, I didn't sign up for this <laughs> when we have suffering but actually we did because we wanted to be born. But luckily we have the middle way of practice out that leads out of suffering. So this Noble Eightfold Path, this 
way that is the way. I mean, the Buddha's even pointed out you don't have to go to the extreme of self harm and spend your whole life fasting. I mean, fasting sometimes can be a useful, a useful technique. Some meditators find fasting can help reduce the energy of the body. Less less energy is expended on digesting food. The body and the mind feel light, and for a while it can. Um, give them some insights or help their mind gather into samadhi even. But it's a, it's a temporary solution and not to be done just for the sake of it. You know, the, the extreme of asceticism is when you're sort of doing it just for the sake of it because you have a wrong view and you think, well, if I do this, it will bring me some kind of insight and help me cut off the defilements of greed, anger, delusion. If I, push them, I'll squash them, I'll crush them <laughs> and I'll get enlightened. But there's still some wrong view, wrong understanding there. So it doesn't work. Even the Buddha had this insight. You know, we all know the um, teaching of the, the three string lute based on the Buddha's had this insight that you have a lute with three strings and this one string is too tight so you pluck it and the sound is ping, just not melodious because it's too tight. One string is too loose, bang, doesn't sound good. But there's one string that is just, just right, tight and just to the right amount, you get a nice melodious sound when you pluck it. And practice is like that, you know, too tight is self-deprivation, pushing yourself too hard to the point of self-harm, increasing your misery but without increasing your wisdom and understanding. To lose is giving up basically, indulging the way of least resistance, you know, eat when you want to eat, sleep when you want to sleep and not really getting much insight either. The middle way is the way of the correctly tuned string, neither too tight nor too loose. And of course, as you practice, that takes a bit of learning you know, to find the right amount, the right effort. As a, as a rare person who will get it right first time, we tend to have to experiment. And you know, sometimes that means you push yourself too hard, too far. Uh, most of us know already without trying what it's like to indulge. <laughs> but the path of asceticism, we sometimes we try and then we pull back to a more manageable level of practice and effort. Sometimes our effort is a response to, you, know, you feel guilty if you have been indulging and you say, oh, I've been sleeping too much, eating too much, not meditating, taking my life too easy, I need to do more, and you feel guilty, so then you push and so you push to be more strict and you see that in practitioners sometimes suddenly they're pushing themselves meditating many hours a day sleeping little eating little talking little go on retreat maybe or just push 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 but they may still learn something it may still have some benefit but it's done in a response of sort of guilt and it's usually unsustainable. So then they have to sort of say, oh, I can't keep this up, it's too difficult. So they come back maybe to a middle way would be ideal, rather than falling back to the old way of indulgence. So we often have this back and forth way of practice, sometimes too hard, too strong, too much, and then back to too little, trying to find the kind of right balance in the middle, the middle way. But the middle way is always bringing you to the point where you can recognize ignorance, craving, attachment, or what we call mental defilement, kilesa. And then it's helping you to actually abandon mental defilement. That's the middle way. So for some people that still means pushing quite hard. 
to abandon defilement because they don't want to let up. They don't trust themselves, they don't trust the defilements. Maybe other people are a little wiser, they're just naturally wise, so they don't seem to have to push too much, but they're still aiming to abandon greed, anger and delusion, the mental defilements. But the middle way is the way that's effective, successful in bringing us to abandon defilement. Whatever works, as long as that's the end result. The ways of indulgence or extreme self-deprivation tend to be increasing defilement, increasing wrong view, sometimes increasing misery, annoyance, anger, anger sometimes increasing greed and attachment. Well, they're obviously wrong and they're not in the middle way because it, anything you do that's increasing mental defilement, increasing your ignorance, lack of awareness, your attachments, is obviously not going towards the end of suffering. And that's what we're investigating pretty much on a daily basis, although sometimes it's hard to tell on a daily basis what what direction your practice is taking. You may have to observe over a longer period of time, like six months or a year or even many years. Day by day, maybe it's just too short. You can't see the wood for the trees. You can't quite see what's going on yet. So sometimes we, we're going off in the wrong direction for a while. It's only after a while we realize this is not working. Pushing too hard or just not trying hard enough at all. And we all know what it's like with, say, dana, helping others, sharing, helping. And sometimes we help too much and get burnt out, and then we have to pull back and look after ourselves more for a while. But we also know what it's like when we're too indulgent or just don't help anyone, <laughs> can't be bothered take advantage of everyone else's generosity and maybe become a burden on others, just kind of get by on other people's kindness. But neither are the middle way. With sila it can be the same, we can sometimes become so strict with our precepts, our morality to the point where you know, we become very proud or conceited, or arrogant, or look down on others who are not as strict or disciplined as us ourselves. And you're keeping precepts, but then you may be getting angry with other people who don't keep precepts. And precepts and rules are not for, you know, basis for forming anger and disharmony in our lives and with others. Uh, the opposite there, to bring up a sense of well-being and ease within yourself and more awareness, more mindfulness, reduce our greed, bring up more loving kindness, reduce our anger. But sometimes we get it wrong. So with the precepts, sometimes they become like a, a weapon and you're always comparing yourself to others and then looking down on others or looking up to others who you feel maybe are very spiritually advanced, very moral, very disciplined people. But we have to look for ourselves, look at our own mind and look at the results of our practice. Sometimes we try too hard and we keep the precepts and we become unhappy and then take it out on others. Meditation the same, sometimes people they are trying so hard in their meditation to be very mindful, they're almost controlling too much and then they get annoyed with anything that disturbs them. So that includes other people or places, situations that are, they feel are not conducive. Actually it's because there's an imbalance in their effort and they're perhaps at first not seeing that. You've probably all had that experience, just trying to become more mindful, peaceful in your meditation and then nearby somebody is making a noise in one way or another and then we get annoyed with that person. 
And really the problem is our own lack of mindfulness at that moment, but we blame the other person. So Majima Patipata is always about bringing the mind back to mindfulness and investigation, cultivating wisdom, insight to abandon mental defilements, the cause of suffering. Ultimately, it's the, that's the result that you're aiming for. That's what defines the middle way. There's perhaps no one correct answer for this in the sense one person's middle way may be slightly different from another. And the general themes will be the same, but you know, how what, much effort one puts into one's practice, how much one sleeps, eats, drinks, talks, meditates, all of this you know, it can vary from individual to an individual. The Buddha pointed out even Arya Pugalas, people who've already experienced some level of enlightenment, already quite advanced, mature practitioners, can still become complacent in the practice and slip into contentment. It's only the ones fully enlightened people have gone beyond that. If you've achieved a certain level of happiness in your practice, you're, you're content with your practice of dana, sila, you meditate, maybe you feel quite good in yourself. Your mind is not too stressed by things. One of the subtler, harder to define, harder to recognize defilements is just complacency slips in, is good enough. This is a hard one because in the beginning of our practice often we're discontent, so we are learning to be more content with what we've got, with who we are, this body, our mind, our personality, our life. We're actually trying to find contentment to begin with so we can have a sense of well-being. But over time that can turn into an attachment itself. When you recognize that, sometimes it's kind of you feel disappointed, it's like you can't win. Trying to achieve contentment and a sense of well-being, be happy in yourself, then you realize you're attached to it. It's like, oh, being caught out again by some form of attachment. But you have to keep looking, investigating. And it's not sure. And if you're feeling content, this may be the result of good, good practice, doing good things, the good karma that's resulted from your past actions. But you still have to reflect on it. It's not sure, it's not certain, it's impermanent. Feelings of contentment, well-being can come and go. And it can be the basis for complacency. In Thai they have the word non your mind goes to sleep. <laughs> becomes so still, so happy and content, it just kind of goes to sleep. You notice that in meditation. When you're not quite mindful enough, you're pe feel, feeling peaceful and calm, but then your mind kind of goes dull, sleepy, goes to sleep. And the purpose of calming down in meditation is actually to arouse mindfulness so you can investigate and see more deeply the impermanent nature of body and mind. But that takes effort to contemplate, to observe, to look. Sometimes we prefer the uh, peace of dullness. You can meditate and get to the point where you can sit for hours on end, still, quiet. So you might call that an achievement but then your mind goes dull. And that's not an achievement, that's, that's an obstacle, a hindrance. So we have to be vigilant on every level. Vigilant, heedful, careful, 
even when we're experiencing the happiness of the good things we've done, the successes of life, not to become complacent. So as one monk said, you know, there's always more to do in your practice. There's always more to learn about yourself, about this mind, about the world. And there's always a bit of suffering waiting around the corner to get you, as it were. There'll be something, as long as you're not fully aware of where your craving and attachments are, then there'll be something that will sneak up on you maybe when conditions change. Even when you're experiencing happiness, pleasantness, you, know, you can enjoy it, but suddenly things can change, can't they? The world can change, you know, external world, the environment, society around you can change, and it is changing. Your health, your body changes, even your states of mind change. So the Buddha encouraged us always to be mindful, be vigilant, Heedful. That's why heedfulness is like ultimately is the the top dhamma, top quality that you're developing. Heedfulness keeps you practicing, even when things are going well. You keep practicing. We know what it's like when we're stressed. We have to practice, and that's often when we practice. You you get some stress, then you want to find a way out of it. So you're, you're feeling stressed. You say, "Oh, I better start meditating again." Or you're feeling miserable, you know, oh, I'll go out and help somebody and do something good. You know, we often know that much when we're feeling the stresses of life, we look for ways out and start practicing again. Because when things are going well, we become complacent, take things easy, take things for granted. And then we're, it's easy for us to get caught out. So keep investigating. Nothing is permanent, nothing is certain. You have to keep looking under each stone as it were. You know, leave no stone unturned in your mind, in your thinking, in your in the way you relate to your life, your world. Because wherever there's attachment, then there's the causes for more suffering are there. I'll leave you with these reflections tonight.